It's often been said that it's much easier to say something in many cases than it is to do it. How often have you heard someone say, oh, well, that's what? Easier said than done, right? Our beliefs are shown and revealed by what we do. You do what you believe. The real convictions of your heart, the real motivations of your heart, the real knowledge of your heart, the real commitment of your heart is seen in what you do. And so James is making that so clear to the readers that are reading his letter. This is a pastor from Jerusalem, and he is saying there are some tests that will help you see whether or not you know and love God. And one of those tests is, and it's a very prominent one, one of those tests is, do you obey what God has said to do? So this morning we come to even part four, and then this next Sunday we'll be moving on, but I'd like for us to look and read this passage of Scripture, and then we will quickly run through the review, and I want you to see this beautiful analogy, this important analogy that James gives, and I believe that we'll have some application from it. James chapter 1 and verse 19, and we've been reading this enough now that I can ask you to read this out loud with me, and so um, go ahead and clear your throat, everybody to do that. <clears throat> there you go, a little cough, a little clearing there. Um, look at James chapter 1 and verse 19, let's read it out loud, don't taper off, stay with it, Continue reading with it, okay? If you mess up, that's okay. Um, we're all dyslexic. Um, let's just read it, and um, I'm really going to ask you to, to listen to it again anew and afresh as we read. James chapter 1 and verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. May God bless the reading of his word. We've been looking at this over the last few weeks, and what we've seen is this. Throughout God's word, fill this in, throughout God's word, we see a massive emphasis on listening to and obeying God's commands. God has revealed himself in the natural world, whether you look through a microscope or whether you look through a telescope, all of creation declares that he exists and that he is. But we know who he is and what he wants by his written word. So he has given us general revelation in the creation and he's given us specific revelation in his word. Can you guys say that together? What's the first one? All of creation is called what? General revelation. That means that God reveals himself generally. So what is all creation? It is called what? General revelation. It's generally apparent that where there's a universe, there's a universe maker. And so we see God in this, and that's part of what we see in Romans 1 and 2, that, that the human soul, the hu every human being that's alive can see that, that this is an, is an enormous testimony. Now some have chosen to attribute this testimony of the world 
to a creator. Others, as we see in God's word, begin to think that we've made ourselves in some way, shape, or form. And we, we see a rejection of the creator even as the, uh, as the world looks at the creation. But those who are hearing God's word and seeing begin to see that where there's a universe, there's a universe maker. So that's general revelation. Now, what do we call the Bible? We call the Bible another type of revelation. What is the Bible? Specific revelation. Can you say that together with me? Specific revelation. It's so specific. Is that what I said? It's so specific that it reveals to us God's very name. God has said, I'm not only the universe maker, but my name is Yahweh. My name is the all-powerful God who loves you. And why did I make the universe? Why do I, do I do what I do? If you will read in my word, you can know what I'm up to. You can know who I am. You can know, listen to this, what, what not only do I want, but what do I require? And so, throughout the Bible, we see this specific revelation of God where we know what He wants. And so, that first point is very important. Throughout God's Word, we're seeing an emphasis on listening to what He said and doing what He wants us to do. Look at this says in the New Testament, or excuse me, the Old Testament. Time after time in the Old Testament, obedience is a major theme. God's people are told to, look at these, underline each one of them, to listen, to remember, to teach, and to celebrate God's works and commands, and then also to be careful to obey by doing them. He has called us to obey Him by doing His commands. There are many, many, and this is so critical to us. Part of the reason that we're in part four on this is because, friends, listen, it's a natural thing to come and just hear the Word of God. And what, what my heart is burdened by is that very often we hear the Word and we walk away unchanged. There's something in us that desires to, to hear the truth and that desires to hear the message. And our mind is stimulated and our heart is prompted. But the real question is, are we moved to obey God? I'm very concerned that there are many who hear the word and do not obey it. There are many who come and hear and sit through in our church, in our circumstance, very often hour-long messages, which I, I praise the Lord for your hunger for that. But the question is, do we go home and say, I, I'm hearing God speak and I am listening to His voice and I'm listening to Him through His Word and I am obeying Him. And it's not merely by emotions very often and most reliably it is by the written word of God that we come to hear what he's saying you know your your emotions or the sometimes the the lack of peace that's in your mind or in your heart sometimes that can be the pizza from the night before you know don't don't make all of your decisions and all of your motivations based upon the way you feel now God has made us feeling human beings he's made us emotional creatures as he himself has emotion but sensation and experiential things that are around us are not to take precedent over what he has clearly said in his word. And that's why I want to encourage you to be one who is what this says, listening to the word of God, listening to it with your life. You say, well, I'm here, I'm here, pastor, what's the problem? Well, my question is, do you, do you, do you listen for 45 minutes on Sunday morning and maybe uh, about 100 of you come back on Wednesday nights? Do you... Do you do you listen at these two times and then 
not carefully listen to God during the week? How much time do you spend listening during the week? Do you read His Word? In our church, we, we recommend that you have a quiet time. We recommend that you spend time with God in His Word, saying like Samuel, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. Saying, here I am, Lord. You, the world is fast. The world's loud. Everything's moving fast. My day is about to move really fast, Lord, but I, I want to hear from you before I go into it. Do you spend time with God? You see, in order to do the Word, you have to have listened to it. In order to obey, you have to have first heard the command. The first command and the first point of the God's will in your life is that you would look to Him and believe. That you would look to Him and trust in what He's done on the cross of Calvary as your only hope and to say, no longer bringing all of my things and all of the good that I'm going to do to expect that God would accept me. No longer do I insult God in that way. But now I come in humble faith recognizing the Creator of the universe has said, I love you so much that I've come to die in your place, to take your sin to the grave, and to overcome death in sin, that if you will believe in me like any else one, any other one who will believe in me, that you can have eternal life. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we transfer trust from self to Christ. That we're no longer trusting in our works, but we're trusting in His work. We're not trusting in what we're going to do. We're trusting in what He did on the cross of Calvary. Now that's the first point of God's will in your life, is to believe upon Him. To recognize Him. And then we are called to follow Him in obedience. Look at the next part here. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus declares that obedience reveals, fill that in, reveals whether or not we know and love God. If you obey, then it shows that you know and love God. If you do not obey him, if you are not listening and obeying, then it reveals that you do not know him. Over and over, Jesus said, he who loves me is going to keep my, my words. He who loves me is going to obey me. If you do not obey me, you do not know me. You do not love me. Look at the next part here. All the New Testament writers, like Pastor James that we're studying now, prominently call for obedient action. Obedient action as a result of real saving belief in Jesus. Wherever you read in the New Testament, you see that we are being called to obey the one that we call Lord and the one that we say has saved our souls. Throughout that, we're, we're called to follow him in obedience and in faith. And here we see in Galatians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. And I want, I want you to see this whole verse, 6 and 7. Look what it says there on the screen that's in front of you. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, just as you received Him, so do what? So walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were what? Taught. You see, listening to the Word of God. You, you're, you're taught. Now, that is why we study the Bible. For those of you who have never been in a Protestant church that teaches the Bible, and, and you say, wow, these people are serious about the Word. That, that's exactly right. If this is the specific revelation of God, and we can know Him through it, that's why we give attention to careful study and careful teaching and saying, Lord, speak to us. We are listening. And so we see that just as we have believed in Jesus, we are called to obey Him. We're called to walk with Him. That's Colossians 2.6. 
Now notice the next part here, and it's, this has to do with verses 22, but really 23, 24, 25, and I want you to see it with me. Look on the box on your page right there on the front where it says in verse 22, it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We've really already unpacked that verse. Now we come to 23, 24, and 25, and we just want to unpack this for a few minutes. Look what it says. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, and then here comes this beautiful analogy. He is like a man who intently looks, excuse me, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Verse 24. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Now, the first part is here, we're told what not to do. We're told what not to do. And what is it that we're told not to do? Look at, the, look at the passage that's here on the screen. And really, in verse 22, it starts off by saying, do not be a hearer only deceiving yourself. Instead, in verse 23, he says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. So, but when he goes away, he's forgotten what, he's, what he is. Now, what kind of a mirror would that be? Did they have beautiful glass mirrors in that day and time? No, they didn't. But they would likely have something similar to this that would possibly be bronze, which is a copper tin uh, com combination that has been pounded out smooth. And after someone would pound out smooth a piece of bronze metal, then they would come behind it with sand, very, very fine sand and uh, water and they would they would just take a wool a piece of wool from the uh, fabric that they would have and they would polish that thing and polish that thing with finer and finer and finer sand until they would come out with something that could give a reflection now similar to this some of you have something in your in your home that is a tray or something that has something sim similar to this. This is a, not a perfect example, but something that has been polished, a piece of metal. And so they would, they would say and they would understand what James was saying as he would have this and they would take that thing and they would look at themselves in the mirror, similar to what you could do with this. And it wouldn't be a perfect reflection. There really are no perfect reflections, but it would be a very, very fine reflection of who you are. And here he's saying, if you're wondering what kind of person you look like, and the, and the idea is this, that you're going along through the highways and byways of life, and you kind of notice different types of faces. You notice different types of people, what, what they look like. <laughs> Interestingly enough, we have someone here that works in software and works on facial recognition software and all of it. You know, it's very interesting that no two people have the exact same face. Aren't you glad for that? You're unique. Really glad that there's nobody else that looks like me. <laughs> Poor soul. Um, but we, we, we all have a unique face. And you can just imagine someone in this day and time that they're wondering, well, what, I wonder what I look like. I, I see all these other people. What do, what, what do I look like? And so he would go to a mirror and he would say, oh, I, I'm this kind of person. I'm this person. And, and the picture here is, is that he looks at his face in the mirror and as soon as he walks away, he forgets what kind of person he is. Now, it's not that mere happenstance analogy that is here, but really this is all talking about the Word of God that we are to receive with meekness the Word of God. And what we find is, is that the Word of God is like a mirror that shows us our true selves. And we can look in that mirror and see our true selves and then instantly forget what kind of a natural face that we have. Notice at the bottom of the page, this is what not to do. Don't be hearers who forget who, um, who, are, who they are and what they look like. They look intently at his natural face in the mirror. He goes away and immediately forgets what kind of person he is. Instead, look, o look at the back side of your sheet. What to do? What are we called to do? 
in verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who what? Who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, let's just kind of notice this. I want you to notice something here in these, in these three verses. Notice the intensity and urgency in this passage. There are some very interesting words that are here. In verse 23, it says, looks intently. Verse 24, immediately or at once he forgets. Verse 25, right there on your outline, the perfect law. It's not just the law, but it's the perfect law. And number four, he perseveres. That is a tough word. The word persevere is a, is a word that it expresses a, an agony in the doing. So it's a, it's a perseverance that is there that continues, a doer who acts. In fact, look at the passage. I want you to see the passage and, and just go ahead and jump to the passage part where you can see that. Look at these words and how they fit into the passage. Uh, it, it, this is, there's an intensity in this analogy. Do you see the red words that are there? Can you read them up there on the screen? A little bit. They're hard to read. I know that. Um, but look at that. Look at verse 23. It says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks, what? Intently. Intently. So this is the guy that's sitting there, not just going, oh, 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 okay, yeah. That. This is the guy that's sitting there going, hmm. Really, really studying himself. Really looking, really seeking to to understand, really, really, really looking intently, noticing the nuances. It's possible to sit there and intently look and notice the nuances and then immediately go away and forget. You say, no, that's not really possible. That's kind of silly. Oh, come on. How many times have you gone and you, you got somebody on the phone and you go, yeah, I'll get it for you in just a minute. And you go look at it and you go, okay, 983-3490. Okay, the phone number is, <laughs> where is it? And, it, you know, and you're scrolling through your phone. And you're, and that night, uh, I, how many times have you gone all the way across your house, you get to the other end of the house and you're standing there going, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Oh, I need to do this over here. And so you go over there and you go, but this isn't why I came over here. What, what is it? And then you, you turn around and, you know, I, the other day I, I told Cheryl Ann and I were talking about something and I said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tired and, and I don't, I'm not thinking very clear. And we were talking about something and, and I, I was sitting there looking at my phone and I was doing stuff with my phone, but she looks at me and she goes, what are you doing? And, and I said, I don't know. And, and, and I'm, I mean, have you ever done that? You're sitting there swiping through things and you're looking through things and you're going, or it, it, lady, it, it may not be that, but it may be you're in a kitchen drawer and you're there and you're going through it and you have no idea why you're going through it and you just go, what am I doing? Why, why am I going through this? Now what James is saying to us is that it's possible to live your life where you hear something as significant as the Word of God and then walk away and immediately forget what it, was, what it said. I mean, how many times has, have I preached on Sunday morning only for Monday to come for you people? And if I were to ask you in the parking lot, so what was the message on yesterday? And you'd stand there and turn six different shades of red as you look at me. And you, you have no earthly idea. Now, th there's a difference in the idea. I mean, you know, you don't remember all your meals, but you are the person that you are. Based, and if you hadn't had those meals, you wouldn't be nourished. And, and I understand that. And that's somewhat of how it is with hearing the word of God. But the real picture is this, though, that James is warning us that there are some people who read the Word of God, listen to the Word of God, but they have no intention of really doing the Word of God. They're somewhat stimulated by the Word of God. They like the intellectual ideas. They like the emotional passion of it. We, we, we like the service or we like the chapter, the beauty, the poetic nature 
of God's word, but then perhaps we just don't intend on it changing our desires and our discipline and our sacrifices and the motivations for which we live our day. James is challenging that mentality. He's saying, are you submitted to God's word or not? Are you going to obey in the happy times and in the sad times? Are you going to trust when it's easy and are you going to trust when it's hard? Are you going to take the stand when it's popular and are you going to take the stand when it's not popular? Are you going to pay the price when the price is very low and are you going to pay the price when the price is very high? James is saying, or what are you going to do? Are you going to forget the perfect law, the law of liberty that can save your soul? Verse 122 says this, receive the word implanted which is able to save your soul. You receive it, and the proof that you've received it is that it changes your life. Well, notice this, fill it in. We are to look intently at God's implanted word, that's verse 21, and to see what it reveals about ourselves. Here's the idea, and put out there to the side, the mirror. The word is like a mirror. Now, before the mirror analogy was given, that, that, that's, the, that's the picture that, that it reveals, fill this in, God's word is like a mirror, which will show your true self. When we begin to read God's word, we begin to see the things in ourselves that are, that are not adding up. We begin to see, as we read God's Word, who He is and who we are not. And if you read the Old Testament and you begin to look at the law and you begin to look at what God was doing through the people, His own people in the law, He was showing them that they were not holy. He revealed to them His law of truth that they could not keep. And so what did you say, well, that sounds like kind of a mean sadistic God no because with the law as part of the law he gave the beauty of a sacrifice and that that sacrifice would come and that that sacrifice was promised to come to take away all of your unkeeping of the law all of your inability to keep the law that he would come and he would show you his grace and his mercy and not by nullifying the law, not by saying that the law doesn't matter, but listen to this, by making up for all of your lacking with his perfectness, and by him coming and completing the law of his promise of grace, he comes and makes us fit for himself. So it's not in our own works, but it's in his work. Notice this, God's word is like a mirror and it will show you your true self. Our true self desperately needs, fill it in, rescue. We need rescue. We need rescue from ourselves. We look in the mirror of God's word and we begin to see how we do not add up. We begin to see how he is holy and we are not. And we see that his fulfilled word, fill it in, his full, full, her fulfilled word sets us free because it's called the law of liberty now it's interesting that the Old Testament law by itself though holy good and righteous did not liberate the Old Testament law it was it was a good law it was a right law it's the righteous law of God it is holy but it does not liberate it leaves us condemned and enslaved if you only had the Old Testament law, there would be no hope because it demands a perfect result and none of us here can live in a perfect way. 
The only hope that we have is that Christ would come and fulfill that law. And that's exactly what we have in the New Testament. The New Testament law fulfilled in Christ brings true liberty and freedom. This is the gospel. This is the gospel that you can be who God really made you to be because of the grace and forgiveness found in Christ. This is, the, this is the, the key to life and joy. This is the key to strength to live. This is the key to saving your marriage. This is the key to, to being the honorable person that God has called you to be. It's that Christ does it in you, not only because He saved you, but He lives within you and empowers you to be who He's called you to be in a lost and fallen world. So now look at that again at the top of the page, verse 25. Look what it says, what to do. I just want you to read the verse again and see it. Look what it says. But the one who looks into the perfect law. Now, above the word, you can put the, the word perfect. You can put there fulfilled. It's complete. The law is complete in Christ. It's the perfect law. So look at that verse. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the complete law, the law of liberty, and then, and look what it says, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he's doing. And that word perseveres is the picture of us doing what God has called us to do. Um, I believe that one of the great grace doctrines that we see in the Scripture is the perseverance of the saints. It means this, that if you're truly a blood-bought, forgiven sinner by the grace of God, if you're truly a Christian, if you've truly come to Christ, then you are going to continue in persevering with Christ until you stand before Him. It's a, it's a doctrine that we see throughout the Scripture that, that God calls us to it. Does that mean that, that you would never wander away? Does it mean that you would never have a time of weakness? Does it mean that you would never um, have trouble and struggle to obey the Lord? No, that is not what that means. Throughout the Scripture, we see that God's children struggle to obey Him. But here's the difference. Those who stop struggling to obey him are not his children. Once one walks away, forgets what kind of person he is, and, and there's, there's not a return to the call to live for God, the call to honor God in faith and belief, it reveals that we don't really know him. And so James is describing for us, in part, this picture that our actions and our behavior will reveal whether or not we have saving faith. It is the one, look at the verse 25, it says, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, I, I just have to tell you that as part of my desire to be saved, as part of my desire to be who God wants me to be, I, I look at that, and that has, even in itself, a motivating factor for me to continue with the Lord. Because you know what? I don't want to be lost. I don't want to, I don't want to not know God. I don't want to go apostate where I deny the Lord I want to stay with him and walk with him and if that desire stays in me and that desire continues to come out in me then that reveals that I'm saved but if I can walk away from all that Jesus has done, if I can walk away from the things that I have heard and the things that I have seen and the things that I appear to have responded to, but if I can walk away and turn my back 
upon the Savior who died, then it would reveal that I do not know him, and I never did know him. We have to go to 1 John chapter 2. We have to go to 1 John chapter 2 and look and see what it says that, that they went out from us to show that they were not with us. Now these are hard words. Let these, listen, let these words do two things. Let them cause you to strive to continue with Christ in faith. Let them also do this. Let them also cause you to pray for those that are around you. Let this be a motivating factor that we would pray for our mothers and our fathers. We would pray for our sisters and our brothers. That we would pray for our children. That we would pray for our friends. That they would know God and continue with God. And if they do not know God, that it would be revealed. You know, l listen, there are some who are as far from God sitting in this room right now who are not obeying God, not listening to God, not following God, and they are as far from God as the guy sitting out there on the beach with the little things over his eyes getting a good tan right now and, and, and has no interest in God. Or is off living in the squalor or off living in the opulence of his earthly existence. Either one. What, what God has called us to do and what James is trying to help us to see is that we are called to live and to obey and to continue with the Lord. And so may we pray for ourselves, may we pray for those that are around us that we would be continuing with the Lord. That is, that is part of what we see in this passage, that we would not forget what we've heard. The nation of Israel, they, were, they would forget and then the Lord would remind them. And then they would forget and then the Lord would remind them. And then they would forget and the Lord would remind them. I encourage you to go home, just right out there to the side, Nehemiah 8, 9, and 10. Just go home and read, especially Nehemiah number, chapter 9. Those three chapters, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10, is a, is a brief history of all of Israel's struggle with God. Friend, one of the things that you may need to do is if you find yourself living in sin, it's not a bad thing for you to say, wow, do I know the Lord? Maybe I'm one of those that heard the word but then walked away. Listen, when God reveals sin in your life, it is a call to repent. It is a call to hear His voice, to come back to me. Forsake that. Follow me. And so what do we do? We repent of our sin. Do you know what the word repent means? It means to do a U-turn. It means to recognize that the way that you're going is the wrong way and that you need to turn around and go another way. And when we, we the Bible calls us to come to repentance toward God. That means that you go, whatever direction you've been going, you, you're called to repent toward God, to turn back to God. And by the grace of God, listen to this, by the grace of God, you can do that. By His power, you can do that. With His help, you can do that. With His help, listen guys, you can continually do that. You can continually turn back to God and turn back to God and turn back to God. And that's what the Christian life is. We keep turning back to God. We turn back, we turn back, we turn back. We follow Him and we, we experience His grace. We just continually turn. Don't stop turning back to God. And you know, if you're really turning back to God and you're listening to His Word, you, what, what begins to happen is you begin to grow and mature in the things that you struggled with so greatly at one time. By His power and His strength, you don't struggle with those anymore. Instead, there's new ones. 
because the flesh never goes away. There have been numerous theologians and there have been numerous great Christians of the past, men and women, who have made this realization that the longer I walk with God, the more sinful I see myself. And do you know why that is? It's because the closer we get to God, we see who He really is. We see how holy and righteous and just He is. And we see how unholy and unrighteous and unjust we are. And we begin to see that we need Him that much more. And and here's the great thing, that there's this flowing fountain of grace. There's this flowing fountain of love and acceptance all found in the cross of Christ. And then if we just keep coming back and we say, I have no life apart from this fountain. I have no hope. But I have all the hope I need as I drink this living water, as I eat this bread of life, as I stay feeding my soul on Him. And so now look at verse 25 again. Let's read it again. See if it means something new. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and what? And perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. Underline the last part of that. He will be blessed in his doing. It doesn't just say he will be blessed. What does it say? He will be blessed in his doing. That means that God is going to help you with your obedience. That's what you're doing of his word. He comes and he helps you with that. There's so many people that have just thought the Christian life is a bunch of do's and don'ts and you go, well, I just can't do all that. I would look at you and say, you're right, you can't. The only hope that we have is that Christ does it in us and He just calls us to come and abide with Him, to persevere with Him, to obey what He says to do. And as long as we stay there, we're fine. Fine, struggle, keep struggling. You're going to struggle to the day you die to honor Him fully. But by His grace, you just, you just stay with Him. And he stays with us. But the one who hears and forgets, it shows that he's a forgetful hearer that's not going to obey. Allow this, even right now as I'm preaching, to say, to to cause you to say, Lord, I want to be a persevering doer of what you say. I want to stay with you. I don't want to be one of those. Listen, friends, we're in South Florida. People move into South Florida. People move out of South Florida. People move into South Florida. People move out of South Florida. I mean, there's a core of folks that have been around here for 50 years, but there are thousands of people that have come to Sheridan Hills and now live in Atlanta or Ohio or New York or Texas or wherever around the globe. But, you know, there's a lot of people that have come to Sheridan Hills and they live right here, but they're not back here. In fact, they're not in any church. They've come and they've seen and they've heard and they've tasted the gospel, but they walked away. The Bible simply is calling us to see that We're to stay with Him and to obey Him. And so I just want to encourage you that true Christians are going to obey. I want to encourage you, let that be one of those things that say, well, I don't want to be a false Christian. I don't want to be an apostate Christian. Let that cause you to run to the Lord. Very practical application for you and me. Number one, receive the Word of God humbly. Just receive the Word of God humbly humbly. Now, I tried to add another H word after humbly, but it's not in the dictionary. I don't think that the word hungrily is correct. 
right? Humbly and hungrily. Humbly and with hunger. God's word says this. Jesus said that if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be satisfied. If we hunger and thirst for God, that he comes and he meets that hunger in our thirst. Look what it says here, to listen, to study, to learn his word. That's why, that's why we study the Bible. That's why when you go home, that, do you know that that's part of the reason that I do the outlines? I, I know some of you, you've never looked at an outline a second time. I want to encourage you, if you'll, if you'll just do this, if you'll go home and read the outline one time today before you go to bed, if you'll go back and you'll look through it and you'll think about it, think about this message, just t- take five minutes and go back to it. If you only did that, that would be helpful. But I've had several of you come to me and say, Pastor Coleman, I use the outline later in the week. I, I use it on Sunday night, and then I go back, I'll circle back on it Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning, and I look back through so I'm, I'm ready for the next Sunday, and, and it's just getting into who I am. I go back and I look up very often. I have a lot of verses that are here. This morning I don't, but very often there's many verses there. And some have said that I go back and I look up those surrounding verses, and I see what you were saying when when you were in this particular point, so that I will know and learn what God is saying. That's why we give attention to God's word. But not only that we receive the word humbly, but number two, that we obey immediately. You see, this is the, the, the word immediately is important. Because what happens is, if you don't obey when God tells you to do something, you will forget. When the Holy Spirit speaks, you listen and obey. This week, I experienced a moment where the Lord gave me an opportunity. I had the thought, boy, I need to do that right now. And it was a spiritual thing with, between me and Him. And in the busyness of the week, that third floor building over there, not that I'm making excuses, but in that, in that moment, I didn't do it, and I forgot about that opportunity, and it was a missed opportunity. I want to encourage you to get good that when the Lord says stop and pray, that you stop. Just try it, even today. Just try it. When He says, hey, pray about that. That thing that you were just thinking about, stop and pray about that. Give that to me. Or pray for her. Pray for Him. It, and sometimes it may involve your stopping and almost like having a little seizure for a moment with somebody where you're not paying attention to them and you're in your own world of, between you and the Lord for a moment and then you come back to them. I'm good at that because I'm ADD. But I, I <laughs> wonder, is he here? Is he here? Is he listening to me right now? You know, Marcy's like, focus, focus. You know, she's... But sometimes we need to have the attention on the Lord in the midst of our busyness. And when we be get good at obeying in the moment, to whom much is given, much is required, but he who is faithful with little will be given much. And when the Lord begins to speak with you and you begin to obey, the Lord speaks more and more and more. It's the way it works. So obey immediately. Do not delay. Do it today. Right there. And we, we see this in the scripture over and over again. Because if you delay, you'll forget. If you do it right now, you, you're not the forgetful hearer. But you're the faithful doer. In our home with Cheryl Ann and Andrea and moms and dads, young parents, I would encourage you with this. Delayed obedience is disobedience. That's between you and God and that's between you and your kids. One of the things that you can do in your parenting is to, you can save them in, from much heartache with God if you will teach your children to obey immediately. Danny, when you give a command to your child, it's good for you to have the standard in your home that when daddy speaks, they obey. And you say, well, how do you accomplish that? Well, that's the reason we have family camp, and that's the reason we have other studies, and that's the reason we help you with that. But you can begin to say, 
when I speak, you listen and you obey. How does that affect Danny and Danielle's children? You see, they, they begin to learn that this authority over me commands me and I am to obey and so that when God speaks to them that they learn to be under authority and to obey. Um, again, easier said than done, right Danny? <laughs> but by God's grace and by wisdom, and by insight, and by a church family, we learn to live in this way. I want to close with this verse. I want you to see it. Yeah, hopefully you haven't put anything away. Look at Joshua 24, 14, and 15. Joshua leading the nation of Israel after Moses. And, and notice what he says here, that there's, that there's this great decision to be made in verse 14. Now, for, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in, what does it say? In sincerity and faithfulness. Wow. This is that Old Testament emphasis on obedience. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. And do what? Serve the Lord. Verse 15. And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. He said, if you're not going to serve the Lord, let the decision be done. If it's not right to you to serve God, then make up your mind now. Look what he says. That's right, Miss Faye. He's not playing. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Ammonites in those land you know. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Put down there below the word serve at the bottom of that, obey. But as for me and my house, we will obey the Lord. We will serve the Lord. I want to encourage you, Christians. I want to encourage you to say, Lord, I don't want to be a forgetful hearer, but I want to be a faithful doer. If you're not sure that you have trusted in Christ this morning, I want to encourage you to cast your faith upon Christ, to cast your trust and belief in Jesus and say, no longer do I want to turn anywhere else but turn to Him. This morning, if you need to turn to God in faith, I invite you to do that. I invite you. We're about to sing a great song, All I Have is Christ. And as we sing that song, I want to invite you. If some of you are saying, I, have, I need to turn back to God. Pastor, when you were talking about 10 minutes ago, about 15 minutes ago, about, about where do we turn and where do we go, I need to run to God. This morning, if you know you need to do that, do not delay. Today is the moment. Now is the time. Choose whom you will serve. Come and run to Him. He is faithful. He will help you stay at the fountain. He will help you to drink the living water. He will help you to eat the bread of life that He is. He will help you consume your life in Him instead of yourself. Listen, this morning I invite you to come to Christ. There's going to be people standing right over there and there's going to be people standing right over here. We would love to sit down and pray with you. Nobody will embarrass you. They will simply say, yes, come walk with Christ. And Christians, that you would say, Lord, by your grace, I will persevere and I will obey by your grace. Would you stand with me for prayer?